Uh, I'm sitting here on the East Coast near New York, and uh, for those of you who are not on the East Coast, uh, either stay awake or good morning, uh, one or the other, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good little ride here. Uh, we'll probably be done in, in about an hour, uh, and uh, because there's very little chance that I'm going to be able to talk to you except to answer a few questions. Uh, also, the uh, slide presentation will be available on the ASQ website. We've uh, enjoyed uh, doing these for this now the fourth session, and I uh, hope you can gain some value here. There's really uh, two purpose uh, two purposes in in our presentations. One is to maybe share our knowledge and insight on the topic, but secondly, it's um, what you can do as a quality professional, which is most of our audience, uh, to be able to go back to your organization and be able to know your role in the given subject. Uh, so a lot of us know our role in quality control and quality assurance and our role as black belts. And so we try to pick a topic that may may be of question uh, to your organization and maybe provide some answers for you. So think about it in your role and going back and say, hey, there's some insight that I can have here. Maybe I should have a dialogue with my organization or my boss or whatever about that. So the topic here is it's still the customer first. and uh, and, and it's purposeful in that way is that um, in adverse times and difficult times, uh, the customer tends to get a back seat uh, and shoddy quality, shoddy performance then leads to shoddy sales and shoddy business performance. And uh, a year ago, I did a presentation at an ASQ chapter in Danbury about dealing with the adverse customer and um, the, uh, I'm sorry, dealing with the customer in adverse times. And, and what we found in the research in preparation for that, just to get up to speed, was that you know the, the good customers that you had that you mess up during bad times come back and haunt you during good times, and they say, yeah, I remember how you treated me before. So this discussion tonight, it's the customer first, is still about remembering who the customer is and um, what your organization has to do to think about them, and also how to incorporate uh, understanding of the customer requirements in, uh, requirements into uh, quality of design, quality of delivery of design. Um, I'm going to attempt to uh, control the, the mouse here, which I'm doing, but I can't see. There we go. So three questions. Uh, is the customer always right? Uh, and I've found a few very humorous uh, topics on that lately. Uh, I saw, is the customer always right? Not, is the customer always right? Not all the time. So I'm going to pose some answers to that question. Well, what impact does customer do customers have on your organization if they are right? Uh, and what role does your quality function or quality department play driving quality by design? Uh, my experience, uh, I joined the Duran Institute uh, 24 years ago uh, by coming off of a design for quality program that uh, the Institute at that time helped us at the corporation I was at uh, redesign our products and services so they met a, a much more higher performing uh, customer requirement. Uh, over the last 24 years, uh, as we identify that the consumer has only gotten smarter and therefore forcing organizations to design better and also design for what the diverse set of customers customer requirements are. Uh, and so my experience is going to be drawn over the clients that I work with at the Institute around the world and specifically a heavily or specifically a little leaning towards the service side, which we believe tends to have most of the customer complaints, um, but always driven from a product. So automotive suppliers uh, hear customer complaints from automotive tier ones. Tier ones hear complaints from their customers, the dealers, and possibly the, the, uh, the drivers. Uh, so when we, when we think about uh, the customer, think about the supply chain, um, and your role in it. And so we'll talk about quality of design as it relates to services as well as goods. Um, of all the, oops, of all the, uh, can we go up two slides? Let's see, there we go. Of all the books that the uh, Dr. Duran and the Institute have published, I'm going to draw your attention to the one over there, the red one, called Duran on Quality by Design. Um, back in 1994, uh, doc, actually back in 19, 1986, Dr. Duran completed his own understanding of what he felt was the best way to manage for quality in that you must 
take your organization from the level that you're at today or the level of control, which is typically the level of firefighting and process control that we're managing to, and drive it through breakthroughs or quality improvement to a new, better performing level. And the lessons that you learn incorporate into design of goods and services. So the trilogy was born in 1986, where his and our belief, and many of the belief of our body of knowledge, is that to have a high performing business, to have increasing sales and low cost, uh, you need to be effective and efficient. To be effective, you have to design quality of goods and products into the goods and services based on the customers into your product designs. Then you have to control them under operating conditions, and then you continuously improve them. Uh, Dr. Duran wrote about quality control and managerial breakthrough back in the 50s and, um, and then highlighted it throughout his five Duran handbooks. Uh, he then spoke a lot about quality improvement and the importance of breakthrough uh, and that evolution into Demaic today. Uh, and he also wrote in 1994 the book Duran on Quality by Design. Uh, and we also had sub subsequent training called Designs for World Class Quality. And that book focused specifically on questions that I'm going to try and answer here as to how important are the customers uh, to an organization when many times we don't even meet the customers or many times we don't like the customers we do meet. Uh, so it's a process by which you gather customer requirements um, in a similar way to quality function deployment. But quality function deployment is a very technical route. This is more a high-level approach. And so as I talk, I'll be relating to what we refer to as quality by design. In today's vernacular, the closest thing you see is uh, the MADV or uh, Lean and Six Sigma design, the MADV or DEMEDI. Uh, so I was reading about and preparing myself for tonight, and I uh, found this statement from an article that said, the old adage, the customer is always right, is completely wrong. And the reason is simple. Customers lie all the time. And, and I thought about that statement, and at first I got a little hot under the collar and said, you know, this person obviously uh, can't pick and choose their own customers very well. And sure enough, it was a restaurant, and you never know who's going to walk into your restaurant. And when someone walks into your restaurant and acts rude, abrupt, dishonest, and you try to apply that statement, the customer is always right, you're going to be wrong uh, because I'm not professing that the customer is always right. But as you'll see, I'm going to profess the customers that you want to keep are always right. Uh, whether customers lie all the time, I can tell you this. Uh, customers that are dishonest will lie. Customers that are unethical will lie. But the population of them are very small. And if you attract that kind of customer, there's a pretty good chance uh, that you're doing something wrong. Uh, I want to first talk about disloyal customers. Uh, why do we lose customers before we talk about why do we gain customers? Um, first of all, there's a lot of choices. Uh, whether, you know, just look at the automotive choices we have, not just choice of manufacturer, choice of style, choice of size, choice of color. We have a lot of choices, um, and for every price point you can imagine. We also are driven by forces of nature that are forcing us to change our minds in a nanosecond. Um, I could walk in, and I was recently in a BMW factory, and I saw a beautiful navy blue car that I thought was great. And then I walked into a showroom of a different automotive company, and in a nanosecond I thought that navy blue was a different color. So two, we, we change our minds. Uh, three, uh, we have a lot less tolerance for subpar, subpar performance today. Because we have choices, we've seen what the alternatives are. Um, because we get subpar service, we're always on the lookout for um, you know, what that means and what we can do about it. Also, we have less to spend, so many people want to spend it wisely. They want better quality for the same amount of money. Um, that forces us to, uh, as consumers, look at other alternatives. Now, those disloyal customers are bad enough during regular times, and if you add to it these really tough times, uh, some of the things you may not see is that the customer's needs themselves change during difficult times, whether they're personal difficult times or whether they're uh, economic decline like we've had 
or a specific industry, such as the home building industry, uh, people just stopped buying houses, or a few years ago when you saw the automotive industry cut, cut, very, cut way back uh, because the demand dropped. And the demand dropped because the consumer, who drives our demand, couldn't afford it. So during adverse times and the times coming out of it, their memory is very good, and that leads to them making different purchasing decisions. Uh, one thing, if you think about the big three in America and you add Toyota and, and all the Europeans to it, uh, coming out of the economic challenge these last few years was a push to higher levels of defect-driven quality. Drive the defects out, get the cars more reliable and higher performing. That drove through the supply chain, and in a very short time, many suppliers in the automotive supply chain were being driven to think differently. Uh, because their purchasers were thinking differently. Um, and usually, if the business or the manufacturer or the designer doesn't do something different during these times, the customer, whether loyal or disloyal, uh, does nothing different. They just look elsewhere to meet their needs. And so here we have, is the customer always right? And our belief is the ones you want are, during great times, they are acting different than they were five or six years ago. And during adverse times, they just have to change their needs in a nanosecond to meet their economic realities. So if you think about a design cycle that changes every you know, six weeks is fine, six months is fine, but if your design cycle is every 18 months or two years, you got a lot of catching up to do, and customers have choices. So what, what one little tidbit we profess is continuous design teams and continuous innovation teams uh, so that you're constantly replenishing your understanding of what the customer requirements are. We'll get to that. Now, what happens when a disloyal customer or a customer whose needs are not met? Uh, it usually leads to more unhappy customers. In other words, the organization is not correcting itself, more unhappy customers, less sales, less margins, less profit, and when the times get better, less, more difficulty getting them back. Uh, that also drives unhappiness in the workplace, and you got a lot of out-of-work employees. Those out-of-work employees show up on TV news stations, uh, as I saw Walmart getting hammered two weeks ago by employees that were out there talking about how bad it was to work there. So the snowball effect happens, so, and it happens very quickly because of the Internet. So where we might have had two or three years to recover, we now have two or three nanoseconds to uh, catch up and do something different. Um, the interesting thing is today, unhappy and disloyal customers warn family and friends in difficult times not to use that business. Um, I have uh, on my phone a program called GigWalk, and GigWalk uh, is a program that allows anybody really to earn money by making sure they have their cell phone at hand, and they'll send you a note that says there's a GigWalk in your area. Go up to a Starbucks on this street and take three pictures and send them in and collect five dollars. Um, another one it might say, "Go count how many people are in line at a checkout at McDonald's." And basically, what they're getting is real-time information about a given store. Now, college students typically use that; they're collecting money. My point is, it's very quick to get information about how something works or doesn't work today. Uh, I understand um, students are going to uh, classes at college in the first day and in the first 10 minutes telling other people what the professor is like so they can cancel their class and get another one and book it faster. So this disloyalty uh, moves really, really fast today. Uh, even if you're a heavy capital asset business like some of your tier two suppliers and tier one suppliers, even tier three suppliers, uh, they have a lot of heavy assets. And when you, you can't switch on a dime, but when your customer needs something fast and trying to drive down defects and you're not performing, they're going to go elsewhere. Now, why do some businesses fail even during this time? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, they've reduced staff and reduced hours of service to deal with their own declining demand. So right off the bat, there are less people working to satisfy customer requirements. Uh, just walked through a factory three years ago, and people were running machines at 70% yield, um, and they were only running them for two shifts a day, 
12 hours a day because they reduced their staff so much that the staff needed breaks or the machinery kept breaking down. Or picture yourself walking into a supermarket and having no one to talk to. So one of the first responses to businesses failing due to disloyalty is they reduce staffing, reduce hours of service. Now that has an effect. Uh, now we give a customer less for less. Uh, in other words, we, we now tell the customer, be with less people and less time, we have less, in, less good stuff for you, so why would you want to come here anyway? Uh, it would be like saying, I'm going to sell you a car with only three tires. Uh, so on your service side, it, it could be deadly. And then the third one uh, is the decrease of sales. So people complain to customers, business is down, people don't want to go to that business. I mean, let's face it, when Toyota was having difficulty with their Toyotas a few years back, Nobody was bragging about go buy a Toyota right away until they figured out it was clear. Um, and as a business reduces, 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 um, starts complaining to the customers that the reason why I have to give you less is because I can't make any money, it just makes it even harder for the customer to like you and sales go down even more. So how do you prevent this from happening or how do you even reverse this process? Uh, well, there are best practices out there. Um, and matter of fact, businesses that lose less customers, which in our opinion, in our belief for this presentation, means less sales, uh, they need to start, they, they needed to or did, focus on giving them more features and stop worrying about efficiency. Uh, so in st throw in an extra feature, throw in an extra hour of service, throw in something. Uh, we tend to focus on the cost cutting. So. The best practice is to say, hey, let's, we should always be looking at efficiency, so we're in a crisis mode here. Let's talk about how we can retain our customers. Let's talk about what their needs are. Maybe they need help driving to the, uh, getting you know, to and from our stores. Uh, I picked up a Christmas tree the other day. They dropped it off free of charge. How many people don't have a truck uh, to you know, pick up your Christmas tree? By the way, I put up a 14-foot Christmas tree uh, this weekend. So. My statement that we'd like you to think about and maybe to have a dialogue with at your organization is the customer your business wants is always right, at least in the aggregate. And what that means is uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a restaurant chain and I don't want rude people smoking cigars in my restaurant, uh, I can clearly post this is a non-smoking area and I choose to not want the smoking cigar person's business. So if the cigar smoking person comes into my business, then I can ask them kindly to put out the cigar and leave. And I'm OK whatever that customer might do, because it's a customer we don't want. As a matter of fact, the customers you are attracting are the ones that are not smoking their cigars in your restaurant. So think about, uh, as an automotive supplier possibly, uh, if you don't want your customer, then you've got to talk about your strategy, you have to talk about the difficulties in meeting the requirements. And matter of fact, I learned from Dr. Dran, sometimes you have to fire your own customer uh, to get the right ones. And the other part of this is aggregately they are your customers. So if the population was increasing of cigar smoking people and you were going to lose business because you needed cigar smoking people, then you might want to change your restaurant rules. And I'm using something very extreme here, but uh, I can tell you when we rent Hertz Rent-A-Cars, uh, or any rent-a-car, some have smoking and non-smoking cars. Uh, and they charge a lot of money if you smoke in a non-smoking car. Now, I'm not a non-smoker, but I've gotten into cars where they smell the smoke. Rules and policies dictate the customers you want and are willing to support and satisfy. If someone comes into your shop or someone wants to have you build a product for them or someone wants a service and it doesn't meet your policy, then one person is okay, two persons okay, but aggregately if they start doing something, if they start getting a voice, if they start complaining, then they start asking for the rules to change. In other words, the customers you want needs have changed and you have to change too. So normally the quality professional uh, is working on freedom from failure and driving down costs. A lot of our Lean Six Sigma projects and improvements and root cause analysis are on that side. In the last couple decades, there have been a number of us who have spent time on the other side as well, helping the organization understand how to think about 
quality function deployment in the sense that if we understand what consumers want in the to in aggregate and we choose to support that segment of the population, then we automatically have decided we have to make meet their needs. To meet their needs, we have to have features in our products and services that do that. And what does quality have to do with it? Well, first of all, the quality function is the conscience of the customer. So they're there preaching that we need to understand the customer needs. And we can get that from the de defect reports. We can get that from customer complaints. We can get that from focus groups. But then we also need to get it from the marketplace. We need to get it based on what other companies are doing. So the initially, the quality function becomes the leader of the pack saying we need to really understand the customer requirements in a way we never did before. And to understand customer requirements, there are much more contemporary ways to do that with multifunctional teams or early design teams than there ever were. The quality professional also can provide the means to, to um, sort that information or that data into information until we truly understand what's critical to customers' requirements. And once it becomes critical to customer requirements, then quality can say, okay, how are you going to ensure that critical to quality requirement is met? So for the rest of this conversation, I want to talk about quality's role in driving these features which meet the customer requirements. Now, the way to think about the features is that uh, if I want to smoke in a restaurant or if I want to smoke in a rental car, um, your company has to provide the ability to do that. So maybe the restaurant has really great fans and sucks the air up like a cigar parlor does. Uh, or maybe uh, the rent-a-car place provides uh, perfumed cars and, and things that allow them to clean it very quickly. In other words, if they have the right features, I buy the product, I use the product, I use the service, um, and I'm willing to maybe even pay a little bit more, so I pay a good price, and therefore you get some share. The more you do of that, the higher your revenue. Assuming you're still doing the stuff in blue, then you should be able to get a better performance here. Now, a lot of Lean Six Sigma programs are working on the right with DMAIC. We want you to start thinking about DMADV on the left. So if you can meet a customer requirements for some basics, like speed, uh, then you might get higher profit, because if you have to do it faster than competitor, the customer might be willing to pay for it. Uh, if you have to get speed because you're slow, you might have to reduce cost to be able to get that profit. Uh, they, it's not mutually exclusive. And the organization that continuously provides the right features and continuously does that at the lowest possible defect level has the highest quality, because you have the highest quality of feature and the highest quality of freedom of failure. Now, we think about the reality of how good we do. First of all, understanding customer requirements is looking into a, a crystal ball anyway. So what we try to do is get our best arms around what do we think the customers want. And we design with some specification more or less of what we think they want. And then we find that even in the design process, the customers have changed their mind. They didn't want dark blue. They wanted navy blue. Uh, and so all of a sudden there's a change, but the customer is not willing to pay for it, and we're willing to, you know, throw in another car to get the right color. So right off the bat, we're at we're at a two levels of variation here. One for because we didn't really understand the requirements, and two, the needs have changed. Then we get into how well we perform to the new designs, and our measurement system gives us false information. Uh, our insufficient process capabilities uh, give us poor information. And then the human being adds to the pain. So with all good intentions, our traditional design responsibilities have tried to understand customer requirements and get good designs, but we haven't been really great at it. We then try to accommodate changing needs by offering the customer a lower price, a discounted price. Uh, we throw in things they may not want. Give them a free subscription to XM radio, uh, but because their needs change and I can't accommodate, we give them some goodwill. Or my internal processes are so inefficient, we're losing all the margins that our design was to create. So good quality by design tries to minimize that poor design variation, tries to minimize the changing needs, because if you do a better job up front, 
then there's an unlikeliness that you're going to be cause you know, you're going to be a problem because of a quick changing need. And if you're working on the DMAIC side, improving measurement and process capability and people skills, then you shouldn't have that variation. But real effective quality by design actually incorporates all of them, meaning we understand customer requirements, we create the features, we identify what's critical to quality, we have an effective measurement system that makes sure that critical to quality parameters are met, we have processes capable of meeting them over time, and we're constantly monitoring the behaviors of people to do that until the next change comes. So what is really quality by design? Quality by design is really understanding in detail who your customers are and what are their needs. Now that might sound a little simple, but when you define customers in a different way, you will get a different answer to their needs. So for instance, if an automotive, if, if a, a purchaser of an automobile is a customer, and that customer is going to drive that vehicle, I'm buying it for myself, they are the ultimate customer. The ultimate customer is the one that wants their needs met, and usually by color, size, shape, model, all those features that you make. But another customer might be a parent buying a vehicle that their children are going to use. And that parent has a different need than I would. That parent may have a much greater need for safety, a need to keep low-cost insurance on that vehicle. Uh, a system in the, inter the, the interior of the automobile to handle children or, I'm sorry, not children, uh, to handle uh, young drivers who get cars messy. If we then continue to define our customer as the dealer, because the customer to the manufacturer, the first people we see is the dealer. Now the dealer has their own customers, but they also have their own needs. So we like you to think about the customer as a cast of characters. And the broader you define your cast of characters, the greater chance you're going to find unmet needs. By finding unmet needs, you'll be able to design to meet an unmet need and probably delight other people in that unmet need, using a Kano term, and therefore get a really big bang. So instead of just saying, you know, we have 18 to 24-year-olds that we're trying to build a car for, we have to say there's an 18 to 24-year-old customer who will be driving a car, some of which are going to be purchased by their parent, some of which they're going to be purchased by themselves, some of which might be purchased by their employer three different levels. And with each of those different levels, you then also get a different set of needs. So what's the quality office doing here? They're getting this list of customers, getting it paradoized, getting a list of needs, getting it affinitized, because there really only is some essential needs that we're trying to group, and really only certain types of customers we're trying to group. So we're always trying to apply the Pareto to get the, the, the biggest bang for the buck. Now, just understanding their needs doesn't mean we have a feature. If someone says, I like blue, that's just their need. How do we translate blue into actually the color of the interior, or the color of the paint, or the color of the leather? So translation is very critical. We have to convert the language of the customer to the language of the business. And that turns into PPAPs. That turns into specs. That turns into the ability to get farther and farther away from the customer requirement. So the reason we have poor processes when we design a new product is usually we either get number one wrong or we can't translate it well enough. We assume we know what somebody means. And it's words like, it can't be too heavy, it can't be too light, it can't be, it's got to be strong, it's got to be uh, featherweight. Those are, those are words that have so many meanings. It's got to taste good. So we need to translate the terms that people use or observe the behavior to see what they do before we can translate. So what we find in quality by design, these first two elements are in dire need, whether you're designing a new car, a new door, a new fender, or where you're designing a new uh, pizza, or a new restaurant service, or a new bank teller service, or a new mortgage, or if you're the supply chain four tiers down and you're trying to meet your customer requirement, uh, these are the two areas that are done very poorly or we take them for granted 
because we don't have enough sophistication in the organization to expand our thought process on who are the customers and get that translation right. And translation turns into question four, uh, what, are the, you know, what are the CTQs? Uh, there's probably about 10,000 important characteristics on a car. Probably only 10 of them are important to the person buying the car. So we better get those 10 right. That's why we're so good at reliability. That's why uh, the uh, fuel, fuel uh, consumption is important. That's why safety failure and, and no safety failure is important. Those two or three things are critical to all cus to customers. But what are the next four or five or six or 20? And that's what we're trying to find. And then how do we hold those 20? I'm sure some of you have seen a drawing that had 50 critical to quality parameters. When in fact, it's easier to list them all critical than it is to really find the ones that are critical. But when you have to treat everything as critical, they no longer become critical. So as we move through quality by design, we're really saying define the customers, measure and translate their needs, measure their needs and translate them into features, analyze the features and design the best ones, design the new product or service, and then verify by controlling the processes that will make that. Now, Duran wrote in 1994, in simpler terms, today we, I just used the, the, the DMADV terminology. We really don't care what you call it. We want you to answer these questions. Why are those questions important? Because when you think about your, your defects you have right now or your lack of sales, and you translate it down through PPAPs, you translate it down through design documents and DFMEAs and PFMEAs, you will find very, very big, thick DFMEAs and PFMEAs that can't answer the question, what are those high, important, critical to quality, critical to performance characteristics, or critical to customer? Because we don't know, because nobody's identifying it. So if, we're try if we can't identify the, F, the Y right, then the F is really not going to get us very far. So understanding those needs have a really big impact. Um, if I'm in the weld shop, and safety is important, and I see bad spot welding, uh, and they say every spot weld is equally important to the next spot weld, but I know that can't be true because some spot welds, no one ever, no one ever rejects them when I tell them they're bad, and other spot welds, they say you can't pass it unless it's right. Therefore, we're distinguishing between what's really critical and what's not. So I have to spend too much time looking at less critical things when I should be spending a lot of time looking at what's critical. So those critical to quality per, per, uh, parameters drive our outcomes, our revenue and cost, because it flows down through the system. Slow slide there. Now, I, I don't know, uh, Walt, if you want to stop and poll the folks or ask a question, but uh, I'm sure you would interrupt me if you did. And, and if you guys do have any questions, you can pass them along to me or pass them along to Walt uh, through the chat. Uh, when I was a disc jockey in college, they always said you got to talk like you've got one person out there. But every once in a while, that one person would call up and say, would you play me a song? So when you're <laughs> doing a webinar and you can't talk to the other people, I hope you're saying I'm playing the right tune. So what role does quality function play in design? And whether you're a quality director, quality manager, quality assurance, quality control, you have different levels. Uh, but but here are some of the things that the quality function can encourage. One is try to get the leaders, whoever it is in your organization, to really examine the features or services that they're providing customers or charging for customers. Because number one, those features may not be meeting the customer requirements. And you're trying to sell something no one wants. It's like trying to sell a VCR machine today when everybody wants a Blu-ray. Um, you know, we have a lot of these VCRs, so why won't they take them? Well, because that feature doesn't meet their need anymore, no matter what price it is. So you've got to get a discussion around, are the features really good? And it's not just the manufactured features or the product features, but how about the services that go with it? Are we charging for too many extra things when, in fact, uh, maybe we can pick up and deliver a car at no charge? Don't survey customers in bad times, you're not going to get the information you want. And this is what's important to continuous innovation and continuous design. You have to always be monitoring the marketplace. 
And whether it's a handwritten survey or a TV survey, what surveys really mean here is observing customer behavior to understand what the customer's needs are. Uh, so that gig walk example that I told you about is constantly monitoring behavior of somebody and giving that information to someone else to do something with. So if you can engage or observe behaviors, you might learn uh, what it is that they do, how they drive, what drives them. And you can also stop working, uh, maybe you can get your organization to refocus projects that are aimed at cost reduction and start focusing them on feature creation. Uh, here's a real simple one. See this all the time. Um, a lot of people have SPC programs, but they're either dead, dying, or faltering. When in fact, if you ask simple question, if we know what's critical to quality, and we have SPC on those, then we should be producing pretty good product. If we don't, why are we working on a quality improvement project that has nothing to do with that because it seems to me that that's critical to the business. So you can redirect projects that are going after cost reduction and focusing them on feature creation by utilizing the same skill sets you have. And I'm sure you guys can come up with a few more. The quality function has a very, very important role to play in driving, getting the dialogue going, getting the thinking going, um, trying to infiltrate design, trying to get on early involvement teams, or early design teams. And if you're in a service organization that has no design, no design capability, uh, maybe you can go back and explain to them that, hey, there is a methodology out there. It tends to work. Uh, whether it's called quality by design or continuous innovation or DMADV or DMEDI, uh, they all have a basic component of really trying to understand customer requirements to get to features, to get to CTQs. Um, so as your quality in our ASQ organization, um, you're going to see more and more smart customers and more and more need to focus our energy on the feature side of, of Dr. Duran's old equation. Otherwise, you're going to have really efficient and lean processes but no product sales. Now, um, I said this was going to probably be a, an easy short night for everybody, and if I stole too much time from you, we can answer some questions. But uh, I found some uh, very interesting, simple tips that were some of the best practice in driving customer loyalty uh, at a time in, in bad times. And, and maybe you guys can relate to this. Um, always give them something for free, but never lower the prices. Um, give them more, but don't give them less. In other words, you know, McDonald's supersizes things uh, and charges you for it. We're talking about like supersizing it without the cost during bad times so that they remember you and come back during the good times. If you think about our business demand down and we immediately cut staff to meet profit, we've increased wait times automatically for somebody, whether they're internal wait times or they're external wait times. And when it comes to the consumer and the customer, we become very impatient. And as I said earlier, disloyal because we have many choices. The longer I wait, the less chance I'm coming back. The longer I wait, the greater chance I'm going to cancel. Um, because it keeps us from doing our own jobs. You have to keep in mind. So any, any waiting period uh, has to be driven down. This time of year, everybody's trying to buy online, everybody's trying to call their health lines, and the worse and worse it gets, not dealing with people, the more and more difficult it becomes us to be loyal customers. So in bad times, try to deal with real people. Try to get the customer to deal with real people um, and be highly responsive because they're very touchy and they want to talk to somebody. That's why they picked up the phone and dialed. This came from a very large shoe distributor, a shoe, uh, or a, a shoe manufacturer and sales organization that will guarantee 100% of their shoes every time, send them back. If you don't like them, we'll give you your money back. And they pay so little money back on those shoes because in order to guarantee that, you must be good or crazy. If you're crazy, you're going to go out of business. But if you're still in business, you must be good. 
So giving them a 100% guarantee is not going to cause you to fix anything really in, with a lot of money, but it gives a very strong message that if we can guarantee it, we're going to give it to you free. Uh, during adverse times, the only thing you can sometimes provide cu customers is a guarantee that you're going to stand behind them in this tough time. And the gig walk, remember that name, gig walk, um, and anything like it. Um, monitor and observe customer behavior to understand it, not ask them. Sometimes the customer doesn't have the right answer, and they don't know why they do some things. But observing them doing it is really interesting. So if you go stand in line and watch people behave, they may not realize they're being tough and rough. Um, and sometimes it just requires them to say, hey, are you having a bad day? Would you like a cup of coffee? Uh, so just a few tips to add to our presentation here. And, and what our hope is that uh, each of you uh, will remember something about if it's not the customer, if it's not the customer, then who's paying for your product? If it's not the customer, who's creating the demand for your product? It is the customer, the ones that you want. If the ones you want are not happy because you're meeting their needs, not meeting their needs, it's a pretty good chance you need to focus on the features. If your features don't include the quality function, if the feature design does not include the quality function, and that might be participating in a DFMEA or in process design, a PFMEA, then you've got to somehow get yourself involved. Uh, if you're already involved, then you have to bring the methods and tools. If you already have the methods and tools, then you probably aren't on this call. And I also would like to entertain that if anybody would like further information on quality by design, you can go to Wikipedia. You can come on to the Duran uh, Lifeline, our free downloads. There's papers there by Duran and us, and we would be very, very happy to uh, talk about it even more. And uh, I also hope that all of you have a very happy holiday and a, and a good new year. And and hope that we see you folks all again next year. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it back to Walt. Um, I see we've gotten about 100 people here, and they've stayed on. So I hope that's a good a good sign. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Joe. What a, what a great uh, webinar. Um, I'm definitely going to have to look up this gig walk. He got me intrigued uh, when I get off the phone here. Especially but, if uh, you have kids <laughs> in college. The kids in college, they want to make money. I think we all do. <laughs> and it puts you, I'm sure the phone companies are behind it, but yep. it works. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, now we're open to question and answers. Now, if, if you folks want to answer a question, please go into the uh, question and answer pane in there in your uh, the dashboard there, and please uh, type in a question. Um, you have one question uh, come in, Joe. Please explain how to deal with cost and price driving customers when customer behavior run counter to quality performance they preach? Boy, somebody had that question before they got on this call, i got to believe. <laughs> Let me try to pick that one apart. Re just repeat it slowly. Okay. Is the customer that be baby behaving badly? Yeah, when, when they preach about uh, customer or, or cost, and then now they're talking about quality, and then they really want both. And they should get both. But usually what happens is you have to separate. Are they talking about if my product costs too much to me and I want a lower cost, is it because I'm paying for the defect that, that I incur because your product isn't performing? Or do I feel that I'm paying too much for a product that I have other choices for? So first thing you have to do is separate the cause of that statement. And, and, and I will tell you, and it goes hand in hand with this discussion, that most customers complain about price when they feel they are not getting adequate features for their price. They usually don't complain about price if there's a defect because we tend to fix that for them. And so if, if they may have a very legitimate complaint that, that this product, or let's say put it in the context of an automotive supplier, which I'm sure it is, um, company ABC wants a cheaper interior at a higher level of quality. And the cheaper interior is going to have less features as a result of lower price. When given the options, let the consumer or the customer make the choice. I can give you the lower price, but there will be less features. 
and those features may cause you more difficulty. We tend to think about the cost discussion on the defect side, but not on the feature side. And, and without sounding like I'm, I'm an expert here um, to this question, once again, if you don't get back to features, there's a pretty good chance you can't solve the cost side because the customer might be thinking, oh yeah, I've got that defect, when in fact there's really something that's lacking in their product or their design. Or if I'm being told to lower the price, then I have, and I can't assume I'm going to lower it by just reducing uh, labor, I have to probably reduce the thickness. I probably have to reduce the type of material. So there are some legitimate features that are going to be removed. And just like adverse times, when you remove features and the customer doesn't know it, they complain. When you remove features and the customer is willing to accept it, they'll pay for it and buy it. Great. Are there any more questions? We've got a quiet group tonight. Last time we had a bunch of questions. Uh, tonight we've got a quiet group. I know there's 100 of us online, so... Well, we could we could put the we could put to the test. So, either this was a deficient free high feature product, <laughs> or I've got total customers that I don't want. <laughs> but it sounds to me like uh, it's just a holiday. Um, and if you guys want to uh, send me a note directly, you're welcome to do that, as the slide says. Yep. And I can't fault you for wanting to uh, well learn a little every night and not let it go on too long okay well great thanks joe well i'm gonna i'm gonna bribe the the audience here we we have a hundred of you uh still online so we're really looking for our next webinar topics and presenters and i know we have a lot of great quality professionals on the line right now so perhaps yourself would like to share something with the membership and then to pay it forward so if you go to our facebook page just type in asq automotive division on facebook and go ahead and leave a comment about tonight's webinar, or preferably, well, both, but uh, leave us a topic that you would like to see on an upcoming webinar series. Or if you want to present something yourself, please contact us. But do that on ASQ Automotive Division Facebook page. And I have a Duran Quality Handbook to give away. It's probably about a $100 value. It's, uh, I think it weighs about five pounds, Joe, so you can attest to that. But um, I'll pick a random person that leaves a comment on our Facebook page and, and go ahead and give away one of these great uh, quality handbooks. And I'll, I'll, I'll up the ante. If uh, somebody does that, I will provide you a signed signature of Dr. Duran and myself personally to the person that they can tape inside. You can't you ask might wonder how that happen. You might wonder how that happens. But I'd ask Dr. Duran if he would sign some uh, templates for me because he loved to sign books so I'll up the ante you send me the person's name and we'll send you a signature okay great great ah, now we got some questions coming in uh, we'll, we'll get a few I don't have to answer the questions do I no, no. <laughs> yeah. um, how do you would deal with the demand to reduce cost to customer year over year when you're off offering competitive pricing to begin with um, that's a classic automotive supplier problem and one we're facing in the uh, so it's it's kind of like I'm going to increase sales 20 percent a year or I'm going to decrease defects 20 percent a year the first two years are easy the tenth year is hard um, the and that's a very typical automotive tier one to tier two and three supply uh, issue um, once again if they're asking you to, to reduce cost every year they either believe you're too expensive compared to the choice they have or they're being bullies in your industry and like recently the industry spoke back and said you know we can't keep reducing price but but usually um, it's a it's a hard message that says we want you to demonstrate you continuously are looking out for cost and at the same time you're not over designing and over featuring the product which drives up cost um, and the 20% each year is a diminishing return unless there's somebody out there who can do it. And once again, it's going to get to some point where the reduction in cost, if it's not offset with technology, is probably going to result in the elimination or the reduction in a feature. And so, you know, if it's the, thick, the thickness of a piece of metal, the thickness of a piece of plastic, the, the ability of a, of, a, of a vinyl to be imperfect versus perfect, 
they're going to have to lose something unless technology kicks in. But it's, uh, we look at that as just a, it's a warning sign to your company to do something continuously and don't expect it to ever change. When in fact, I think, believe it, this year, the automotive companies had to go back to some suppliers and say, okay, I'm going to let, I'm going to let you off the hook because uh, I realized that we designed it poorly and you're making it just as poor as we designed it. So we can't really get a reduction unless we work hand in hand. Uh, usually companies that have a very good relationship between customer and supplier don't usually have those kind of conversations. So you might want to check uh, check the relationship side too. Great. Thanks, Joe. we got a lot of comments coming in that the uh, great webinar, very informative, excellent. So I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out of their busy schedule and, and joining us tonight. And like I said, uh, your odds are pretty good. There's 90 people or so online when I made the announcement that we'll give away this uh, great quality handbook, Duran Quality Handbook. So go ahead and visit us on our Facebook page and uh, win a free book. So I'd like to thank everybody. Have a great night, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Look on our website for our next uh, dates. Thank you. Thank you.